Singing for the Christian is, um, it's always singing by faith. We don't really know what we're singing about. Uh, as we think about uh, all the grace that, we, that is ours and all that uh, is yet to come, um, those things haven't been revealed to us all yet, and yet we, we believe it's true and we claim it uh, because God has promised it to us, and uh, we're experiencing as we grow more and more uh, what it means to be loved by a living God and uh, what it means to have the promise of eternal life. And all that God has promised to us, it's an amazing thing. Tonight, as we come to the Lord in congregational prayer, we want to be praying for uh, Kathy Marsh. just asked us to pray for her friend Margie, who's in the hospital and uh, is in a great deal of pain. So we want to pray for her. Um, we want to uh, give thanks to the Lord for the Chatty team and their work and for others who are involved in mission work this week. Uh, it's great. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for a, a healthy little grandson, uh, Rudy Andrew Bells, born on Monday, to Max and Emily, and, and I'm very thankful also that my wife made it home today, and um, praising God for that. And so the Lord has been uh, just very good to us. Let's uh, bow our heads together in, uh, oh, excuse me, Nate DeReicher is getting married this weekend, right here somewhere, yeah, there he oh, sorry, <laughs> front row, thanks Nate, I saw Chris pointing somewhere and I was looking for it, so we want to be praying for you. And uh, for Elsbeth, and then uh, also um, Julie Conning and Mike are getting married uh, this weekend as well. So a big week. Let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you that we can banish all of our sadness because Jesus Christ has come to overthrow sin and death and hell. And so that, Lord, we are the recipients of your love and grace. And Lord, we just confess that those truths are deeper than we know. And yet we thank you for what we do know by your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for this good day today of, of, of worship this morning and again this evening, a, a good day of Christian fellowship, a day, Lord, where we uh, just had the privilege of seeing you at work as you are ministering your truth into our lives and, and uh, teaching us, Lord, again and again of our need for Christ and all your faithfulness to us in him. Thank you, Lord, that we walk this pilgrim journey together. We don't do it alone. I thank you, Lord, for all the good things that you are doing in our midst as lives are being transformed, as uh, people are, are being brought face to face with their sin and, uh, and are finding in times of trial the comfort and the grace of God. Father, these are, um, these are magnificent evidences of your presence. Thank you, Lord, for professions of faith. We thank you, Lord, particularly for our young people as uh, your spirit is so wonderfully at work in their lives and pray that you'd bless them as uh, many of them are down in Chattanooga and uh, pray, Lord, for this week that your spirit would be with them, that um, they would have the joy of being um, ambassadors of the gospel and uh, agents of grace. And Father, I pray that uh, we would just um, be able to See your goodness as they have a good week of ministry and then travel home again. Father, pray for Brenna, too, and the OPC team in Haiti this week. Uh, Lord, we thank you for these opportunities that we have to step outside of our normal life and to um, just uh, engage in ministry in a different way. Father, we, we uh, pray for Kathy's friend Margie and ask for your blessing on her and as Kathy tries to comfort and encourage her. We pray, Lord, for our elderly and the particular trials that come to them in old age and uh, Father, we pray that you would bless them. We pray for marriages in our congregation that are difficult and, and, uh, and struggling. And pray, Lord, that you would give grace to help us die to ourselves. And Lord, we all need to grow in this as we heard this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given to us as a, as a body. We pray for New City Fellowship and ask for your continued blessing on Micah there and, and those who are leading and for the ministry that's taking place there. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the joy of having a, a daughter uh, a church where the gospel is being proclaimed. And, and, Lord, people are responding to it. We thank and praise you for that. Lord, we thank you that... Um, you blessed us, uh, Joanne and I, with a little grandson, and be with Max and Emily and, uh, as Emily recovers. And thank you, Lord, for little Rudy. Thank you for safety for Joanne and coming back home. Father, we, uh, we pray for Nate DeReicher as uh, he'll be married this weekend, and for Julie Conning and Mike as well. Father, we thank you for this good gift. Uh, and uh, Lord, thank you that in marriage we learn to lean on you. Uh, it is a great uh, instrument, a great place for sanctification as we must die to ourselves. But Lord, there's so many joys in it. And so we just pray that you bless Nate and those who will be traveling this weekend out to Maryland. 
and to be with Julie and Mike as well. And Father, we pray that you would honor your name as you uh, bring these lives together. Lord, we belong to you, and thank you that no matter what this week ahead holds, uh, Lord, you hold us, and um, Father, we'll be okay then, and you will, uh, you will in the end have the victory. You will have your way. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together with our offering. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the fathers you have blessed us with. Thank you that you are the ultimate father in heaven. Uh, please bless these ties and offerings. Please use them to further your kingdom. Uh, please open our hearts and our minds as we now hear your sermon this evening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I invite you to turn in your Bible with me tonight to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. I've decided to put 1 Peter aside for a little while, and we'll return to the book of Psalms for our summer series in the evenings. And I just have to say, as I was studying Psalm 12, it is a profoundly relevant psalm. I think you'll find that to be true. It's a relevant psalm for our day. And so we're going to give our attention to Psalm 12, Psalm of David. We don't know any specific event in David's life that he's uh, referring to, and so it's a, it's a general psalm as David reflects on the world around him, and uh, we're going to note David's uh, prayer and God's response to that. Let's look then at Psalm 12, beginning at verse 1. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of men. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongues we will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man.
Have you ever prayed uh, that single word prayer, help, help, maybe two words, help Lord. Uh, That's the prayer that we have here as we uh, pick up Psalm 12. It's save Lord. It can be translated uh, as as help. It's the sort of prayer that is very urgent, very short because you don't have time to put a lot of thoughts together or just because the the distress is so great, the the need is so great that that you uh, simply, all you can say is Lord help. It's it's all uh, that you can come up with. And and David seems to be in a, a time of great distress and he prays here. Uh, One of his favorite prayers, if you've read through the Psalms, you'll note that this prayer comes up often in David's Psalms. Psalm 3, 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Psalm 7, verse 1, O Lord, my God, save me and deliver me. Psalm 22, O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. David lives in a relationship with God where he experiences God as his help, his shield, his fortress, and he experiences his own deep need of all that God is. And so that's the prayer we have, a simple prayer, but very profound, very pleasing to God. When we come and just acknowledge the truth of our need, our weakness, our inability, we can't fix it, we can't save ourselves, can't rectify the circumstance, the the situation, uh, and yet the weight of it is real, the grief of it is is real and deep, and all we can say is help. It honors the Lord. It, It acknowledges our weakness and His ability and His willingness to engage and to come to our aid. David is crying to God for a reason. The truth, the godly one is gone, he says. The faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Uh, you might get a, a, a sense here of how relevant already then this, this psalm is, uh, because research is showing that in uh, our country, religion seems to be on a serious decline. There's a drastic reduction in our country of those who profess to be Christian. Now, I know that uh, the, 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 the biggest portion of those who have moved from the category Christian to non-Christian in the polls are most likely those who were nominal Christians to begin with, sort of cultural Christians. They were Christian because they, they were just maybe brought up in a Christian home or had some loose relationship to the church. So it's probably not a, real, a true reflection on the number of, of um, actual believers declining in that sense, but yet it does suggest that things are changing in our culture. Church attendance is dropping off. Sociologists are saying that uh, what happened in Europe after World War II seems to now be happening here in America as well, as many had said it would. That the, the church is being intentionally moved to the outer perimeters of public and social life. And in certain parts of our country already, the voice of the believer is barely heard. The salt and light of vibrant Christianity is barely perceptible. I don't don't think it's being uh, alarmist to say that darkness seems to be increasingly settling over the land. I don't think that's alarmist. I think um, it's, it's happening. And yet here in Psalm 12, we have some encouragement in a way to to note that this is not uncommon. It's not uncommon for there to be periods of decline. David is seeing that happen in Israel. Uh, There remained a form of godliness in Israel. People would still go to the temple and and they would still say that they believed in God. But David says that the godly, those giants of the faith, those men and women who stood in the community as bright shining lights and had a great influence in the community in general, that they've disappeared. They're, they're gone. Maybe they, they've just died off, and, and now there's a new generation uh, that's become infatuated with prosperity. Remember uh, when David takes the throne? Uh, enemies are beaten back. Israel's borders are expanded. Prosperity is coming to Israel, and prosperity often brings spiritual decline. And so David is grieving the, uh, the fact that everywhere he looks, he seems to see that spiritual weakness, spiritual blight. There's just not that fervor, that, that, that uh, vibrancy that he once had seen. The godly are no more. And you find that throughout church, the history of the church, there have been periods of decline. You think of the days of, of Noah, when only a few righteous are left. Elijah cried out, I only am left. 
He wasn't the only one, but there weren't many. Uh, David, uh, the godly one is gone. Uh, the time of the Reformation, when the gospel, uh, the truth of the gospel was nearly snuffed out. Uh, Europe, where you find churches after church after church after church that's been cha- uh, changed into a museum or a nightclub. Uh, Islam is on the rise in Europe for sure. And it seems like in our, in our nation, secularism and all the various isms, uh, humanism, materialism, um, are, are all on the rise and that the, the influence of, of Christianity uh, seems to be on the decline. And, and David grieves this happening in Israel. And there are, there are effects, there are fruits of that decline. Um, there are things that happen to a culture there's to a society when God's people are silenced and, and God's truth is no longer accepted. And, and Psalm 12 is, is very in, just insightful, I think, for our, uh, our place, our time. As we think about what's going on in our, in our society, notice what David points to, the things that are happening because of the decline of righteousness. There you find the increase of deceit and defiance and depravity. The increase of deceit, defiance, and depravity. So verse 2, everyone utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. So when the gospel declines, evil increases, and the devil is the father of lies. And you'll find people happily exchanging the truth of God for lies. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. I was listening to a sermon by uh, Jeff Thomason. Uh, he was just pointing out the various ways this happens. The car mechanic tells you you need a major repair on your car when you actually don't. Your dentist says you need comprehensive dental work on your teeth when you actually don't. Uh, the journalist reports a story with, with such a slant that you can't recognize the events, even if maybe you were part of the story. Uh, so we have fabricated news today, and you know of these, uh, the incidences where... Um, News reporters have been caught just absolutely making things up. But not only do people fabricate news, they fabricate their identities. It's been in the news this last week or so, Rachel Dolezal. Uh, and I just feel sorry for the lady who insists that she's black, though her parents say, no, you're, you're Caucasian. Um, and, and yet um, she's been living this lie for a long time, and she's, uh, and she's maintaining her identity. Uh, that that she is she is black. She was just re- interviewed recently on TV, and and uh, the person said, "Would it be true if 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 uh, for you to say that you are you are a black person? Would that be true?" And she says, "Yes, that would be true." Just fabricating an identity. Political leaders lie with impunity. The car salesman assures you the vehicle was carefully driven only by an old lady. Uh, The man who fills out his tax forms lies about his income. The abortionist says that having an abortion is easier than having your tooth out. The professional athlete denies taking performance enhancing drugs. Everyone lies to his neighbor. We've gotten used to it. It's uh, become commonplace. Uh, we've, We've become cynical. When politicians say things, we don't believe them. When, uh, when, we, when we hear things reported, uh, there's a cynicism that's taking place because we sense that you cannot just trust uh, people to tell the truth. Things that we had assumed would take place seem to be taking place less and less. And David is grieving this. This is what happens when evil comes. Lies increase. And, the, and that uh, it, it necessarily is, is so because, again, um, the, the devil is at work then in greater ways, and he is the father of, the li- of, of lies. But not only is there increase in deceit, there's increase and in, increase in this a defiant attitude. Look at verses 3 and 4. They're just, this is strong language. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts, those who say, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us, or they are our own. Who is master over us? That's what our culture is saying. That's what you see more and more in society. People just saying, we will declare what is true. We will determine what is real. With our mouth, we will speak it and declare it. And who will stop us? Who is master over us? Our mouths are our own. We determine our own reality. And so you have the sad, sad case of Bruce Jenner, who demands, right, on the front page of a magazine, call me Caitlin. Call me Caitlin. I will determine what is true, though every gene in his body, right, is, is male. 
Um, why is he lauded so mightily? Why, why, why is the press in exalting this as it does? Why is, why is this man now suddenly appraised in such a way? Well, I, I'm convinced it's not about gender preference. Um, it's, mu- it's, it's about something much more significant. It's about taking a stand against the creator of heaven and earth and man declaring his independence in the most radical way. I will be the master of my fate. I will not bow to the limits or boundaries uh, that have been ordained by the maker. With my mouth, I will declare what is true. I will determine what is yet to be. And it, so it's a claim to Godhead. It's a claim to ultimate <coughs> authority, which is why many have referred to uh, Jenner now as a goddess. Brendan O'Neill writes, there's a pl- palpable religiosity to the wild hailing of Bruce slash Caitlin as a modern day saint. Within four hours, more than a million people were following uh, his, her new Twitter account, hanging on his, her words like the expectant horde waiting for Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai. Every utterance, all banal celebs speak, was retweeted tens of thousands of times. Celebs and commentators greeted her as a kind of Messiah. I saw one such uh, tweet uh, where someone just gushed, a goddess, a goddess, we are not worthy of this goddess. You see, such language just reveals that this isn't just about sexuality issues or gender issues. It's, it is a claim to godlike dominion. This is man's rebellion. It's man's defiance against the maker of heaven and earth. And in its blatant, blatant stages, this is, this is just man today and woman sticking their face, their fist in God's face and simply declaring we will not have a God rule over us. We will speak our truth. We will determine our identity. We will declare our future who is master over us. That's is, that is what is going on in our culture today. Who will tell us any different? Who will rule over us? And uh, well, Psalm 2 the one who sits in heaven laughs. Let us cast off their bonds, right? That's what the kings say. What's a peop- that's what people say. Let's get rid of the, the, the bonds uh, and the cords of God. Let's, let's, uh, let's be our own gods. And the one who, who sits in heaven holds them in derision. Who will be master over us? God will be master over you. God is master, right? He created us, and he will hold us to account. He will judge our world is, is not uh, off, the ra- off the tracks, as, as uh, some are saying. Our, our society is simply doing what societies do when they exchange the truth of God for a lie. This is normal behavior for evil. It is irrational. It's, um, it's twisted. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for for darkness, and, and that is exactly what's going on in our, in our society. We have, uh, we have entered into a realm where truth and objective reality mean nothing. Not only are lies blatantly told, they are now the new truth, and those who dare to say that the emperor has no clothes will be prosecuted. That's where we're headed. And the reason is, you see, because depravity, vileness, is being exalted among the children of men. Verse 8, on every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of men. Is anything exalted in our society today more than vileness? The word means worthless, vain, moral foolishness and filth. Something to be thrown away, taken out with the trash. As you walk through the checkout line at the local grocery store, you'll see that's exactly what should happen to almost everything you're looking at on that rack. If you listen to popular music, you watch MTV Awards, you browse a local bookstore, just pay attention in any way to your newspapers and to what's on television. What do you see? You see vileness exalted, moral foolishness and filth. We've gotten used to it. We've become accustomed to it. or We just learned to turn away. But it is there, it is growing, and it is not harmless. There is an aggressive predatory nature to evil. So David says, on every side the wicked prowl. What does that remind you of? 
Someone prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So evil is not content to leave goodness alone. It's, it's always looking to defile. It's always looking to destroy. Always looking to divide and break down what God created and what God made good. And so as, as wickedness increases in society, the society will not be interested in leaving well enough alone. Uh, those who have exalt in vileness are not interested in leaving you to your convictions as long as they are allowed to chase after theirs. And so it is not enough, you see, that people are allowed to do what they insist on doing. It is now required that other people participate or give their assent to it. Or there will be consequences. And you're seeing things and consequences today that would have, if if someone would have told you 10 years ago or maybe even five that these things would be happening in the way that they're happening, the rapidity that they're happening, you wouldn't have believed it. We're going to have a big Supreme Court issue uh, coming up here in a few days, probably, maybe next week. And they're going to decide on the issue of homosexual marriage. And I've read thoughtful men say that we very well might begin to experience the consequences of our biblical biblical convictions in a matter of months. As laws are radically changed now to accommodate a new right. Evil is predatory. Evil is aggressive. It cannot abide with good. It must seek to suppress it. That's the world that we're living in. That's where society is going. But we are, we're not alone, right? So David prays help and God answers. God gives protection for the needy through the word in the world. So because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. We don't, um, God is still still on the throne, isn't he? He's superintending the nations. He's not abandoned this world. And so even when it seems that wickedness is gaining the upper hand, our sovereign God is, is, is on the job. He's at work, accomplishing all that he has purposed. Nothing is being lost in that sense. And and so when we say help, Lord, we're speaking to a present God and a God willing to hear. So David speaks his assurance. You, O Lord, will keep them. God says, I will now arise. David responds, Lord, I believe it. You will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. Evil will not ultimately triumph. God will guard his people. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't suffer. We looked at this morning where um, we will suffer. We'll suffer in various ways, the losses of, of, of rights or uh, maybe the loss of, uh, we could lose all sorts of things. We could lose uh, pr- property, we could lose uh, wealth, we could lose health, homes, lives, right? But there will be no harm, not for God's people. They will be guarded for everlasting blessings. They will be guarded from the evil that's on the prowl. There, needs not, there need not be any fear. And, and notice David immediately goes to speak about the word of God in this. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. God keeps his people through his word. It's always been that way. And that when the word is neglected, when the word is not studied, when it's not preached, when it's not applied, when it's not known, then, then God's people are in grave danger. But when God's people are in the word and under the word, uh, they thrive, even in the midst of great trial. You look at the early church, you look throughout church history. When there's been persecution and the word is being proclaimed, the word is being embraced, the church is thriving. We have, a, we have God's protection right at hand here in his word. And to notice how David delights in contrast to the vileness of the words of men, the double talk, the flattery of the lips of men, the boasting of men. God's words are pure. God's word is true like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times. Every word rings true. And because it's true, it accomplishes the task for which it was sent. Throughout all the ages, the Bible stands, right? Against all its critics, in spite of all the false teachers, all those who have scorned it, all those who have sought to discredit it, the Bible still stands. Other people write their books and uh, state their truths, and it's quickly revealed to be just nothing but paper. But God's Word is a rock. God's Word is absolutely eternally 
true and mighty, and it's a protection. And, and, we're to, and, and God's Word then operates in our lives to keep us in the world. I just want you to notice that there's nothing in Psalm 12 about God saying He is going to take us out of the difficulty. He doesn't, um, so I, you, will, you will guard us from this generation, but they were going to be part of the generation. There's no, there's no uh, by and by that, that David's looking, let's just, let's just get out of here or um, somehow escape the reality of the world that we live in. You see, it would be easy to read Psalm 12. And I have to confess, as I was studying this, this week, and, and I, I was thinking, I, I could have brought you tonight, I could have brought you illustration after illustration after illustration after illustration of the things that we've been talking about. I'm, I'm just trusting that I don't need to convince you of, the, of, of what's taking place spiritually in our, in our society. It's, it's just all over the place. And as, I, and as, I'm, as I'm studying this, there is a tendency, right, to think, well, if that's what's happening, what are we going to do? And it's very uh, natural in that context for Christians to think, well, we need to protect ourselves. We need to sort of gather together, circle the wagons, um, retreat from society, retreat from the world. Let's protect ourselves. They're out to get us. They're out to get uh, to in, in, uh, um to get our children in a sense, right? To convince them of a, of a different way. We, we see the evil. We sense the danger. We experience the hatred and the scorn. It would be very tempting to just retreat. And Christians often, often do exactly that. But every time the church retreats, it's being disobedient. It's being disobedient. It's not following Jesus. It's so when we talked about following Jesus. Well, Jesus came into, he approached, he entered this world. Just as vile as ours and more. He, and, and he did so in order to offer his life an atoning sacrifice for vile men. People like Paul, the one who was killing Christians thinking he was doing the will of God. The ISIS of his day in personal form. Matthew, the greedy betrayer of his people. Just a despicable man. The adulterous woman at the Samaritan well. All those who were exalting in what was vile and yet Jesus came to rescue them. He, he came to the world. He's not willing to leave this world in its, in its lost condition, in its sin. He's willing to die for sinners while they are in all the perverse, arrogant, rebellious, vileness of their sin. And friend, if he wasn't willing to do that, you would have never been found. So that's the beauty of what Jesus has done. And that's the one we're called to follow. I'd like you just to turn quickly to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we'll wrap up with this. This is John chapter 17, it uh, takes up all the themes of Psalm 12 in light of the gospel. John chapter 17. Just listen to the themes that we've, that we've, see, we've seen here in, in Psalm 12 about the word and about being in the world. So Jesus says, verse 14 of John 17, this is his high priestly prayers. He's on the way to the cross. Speaking to the Father, I have given them, the disciples, your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That's exactly what David's talking about in Psalm 12. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. All the same themes. Jesus looks at the world and says, Lord, the world hates them, hates me, hates you, the Father. But I came into the world, and I've sent them into the world. Father, keep them. And how are they going to be kept? They're going to be kept by the word. Sanctify them by your truth. Sanctify them by your word. So that they are fruitful. So that they bear fruit to the glory of God. That they live not only lives of holiness, but so that there is a gospel impact. I am sending them, Jesus, sending his church into this God-hating world because God so loved the world 
that he gave his own son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friend, there is great, great temptation as we see our culture increasingly uh, decline, our society increasingly uh, exalt what is vile. There will be a great temptation to retreat. But Jesus Christ calls us into this world. We are the ones who've been given by the grace of God the only message that can save this world. We're to be in, not of, but in bearing the message, calling people to faith, calling people to repentance. Though they mock and scorn, doesn't matter. We're, we've got a mission. And we have the confidence that as we're engaged in the mission, God will do exactly what He promises. He will keep us. One of the, one of the greatest words in the Bible the word to keep. The Lord will keep you, right? He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. He will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. We don't need to be afraid. And so when you, when you hear the news and you see the tragedies and uh, and you see vileness exalted. Don't give in to scorn. Don't give in to contempt. Don't allow for self-righteousness. That is what we are by nature. That's where we would go apart from the grace of God. Recognize, friends, this is the mission field. This is the mission field. That we're to be the ones who speak the very true words of God in the face of the flattering, lying lips of this generation. But believing that, we will be kept and God's purposes will be fulfilled. We are in for some exciting days. I, was, I ran into Craig Troxell at the General Assembly and uh, I don't remember what the topic on the table exactly was, but it was about cultural decline and he says, it's going to get exciting. And I thought, that's a great attitude. That's a great attitude. It's going to get exciting. It, we don't have to uh, ask for persecution. We need to pray, Lord, keep us from the evil one. But we don't need to be afraid. We've got a mission. We've got a God in heaven, and the truth will prevail. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you've called us to live in this time, in this place. You've called us, Lord, to be salt and light in this world. And Father, uh, we are scandalized often by the evil we see around us, and yet, Lord, the truth is that by nature, by sinful fallen nature, we are the scandalous ones and, and you've called us now to new life and you've called us into the light, you've given us the word of grace and you've sent us into this world and so Lord we pray that you give us wisdom, give us grace, give us courage, protect us from evil and the evil one and Lord I pray that you would keep us in the word. Keep us in the word. That we would be, Lord, protected by your truth and by your love and by our Lord Jesus Christ as he directs us and leads us and shepherds us with his voice. Oh, Father, I pray that the church would be faithful and fruitful in these days. That we would see more and more men and women coming to faith, being converted as we speak the truth of the word of God as we point to the, 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 the silliness, the irrationality, the foolishness of the world in which we live, as we point to the emptiness of the promises and the, this, the folly of the plans of this world to try to fix itself in rebellion against God. But Lord, may we do so winsomely and with courage and with a life, Lord, that shows that we belong to another king and we're citizens of another kingdom. Father, I pray that you would help us as a church to delight in the mission that you've given to us and that we would, by the Holy Spirit, see, Lord, wonderful conversions taking place. And we'll give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.